Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of Science Sundays back at the Union. I'm John Beacom representing physics and astronomy and I'm representing a committee of faculty from all around the College of Arts and Sciences which includes our colleagues in humanities. Within the college what our faculty are trying to do is advance the frontiers of scientific discovery to understand the complexities of our modern society and to nurture creative expression. That's what we're faculty are doing and that's what we share with our students all the time. But an important part of our work is also sharing that with the public and that's what we do here in Science Sundays. So we're, we're privileged today to have my colleague, uh, Professor Adam Leroy from Astronomy. Adam is an a internationally renowned researcher and part of the uh, way we know that is he's been able to get fantastically huge grants of telescope time uh, on you know radio telescopes, the James Webb Space Telescope, things like that. He beat us all. He beat the whole department combined, basically. And that's because of the vision of the work he's trying to carry out. He's also an acclaimed teacher and a fantastic colleague in terms of helping to keep the department running. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Leroy. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. So first, of course, thanks to John and the organizers. I super appreciate the chance to talk. Um, but even more, thanks to all of you for coming out here. Um, my goal today is basically to take a gray fall afternoon and show you a whole bunch of beautiful pictures of the universe. Uh, and in the process, I hope to give you a new view of galaxies. So without much more preamble than that, uh, why don't we just jump in? Um, so I'd like to start off by orienting us. So we, of course, live on a planet, Earth. We're orbiting around a five billion year old star, the Sun. Uh, our Sun is part of a galaxy called the Milky Way. Uh, it's one of about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and it's pretty average in terms of age, having planets, and its location. So just to check that this works, so the location of the Sun in this artist's conception of the Milky Way is about down here. Um, so sort of living part of the way out uh, in a totally normal place in a totally normal galaxy. And the Milky Way, it turns out, is one of, among, of uh, many, many galaxies that we see. In fact, if we look in any direction, we see a universe full of galaxies. Uh, to me, one of Hubble's neatest accomplishments as a telescope uh, has been to just super vividly show that even an apparently empty patch of sky, which is what this is a picture of, uh, is actually full of galaxies. So if you take the density of galaxies in the sky that you would infer from pictures like this by Hubble, you might infer that there's something like 100 billion galaxies within the part of the universe that we can see. And when we think of galaxies, I think most people think of something like this, a disk of stars or something similar. This is a visible light picture. Uh, so our nearest, it's a picture of our nearest neighbor galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy which is a twin to the Milky Way galaxy in many ways. I just to see how lively you are. So how many people have had a Macintosh and saw this as their background for about two years? <laughs> I see, okay, I see some hands. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so this picture, uh, you know, clicks with that view of a disk of stars in space. Andromeda is its own galaxy. It's full of also about 100 billion stars and has, you can see here, accompanying smaller galaxies orbiting around it. Uh, but if I'd like you to walk away with one big thing from today, uh, it's that this isn't the whole picture. So beyond just being a collection of stars hanging out together, galaxies are these dynamic, vibrant places where stars are being born, they're living, they're dying, and this is all linked together in a broader context. And a key part of that is that the space between stars is not really empty. I think this is one of the most beautiful illustrations of this that I have seen, and to, to maybe drive this point home, what I want to describe here is that when these pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope showing sort of the glow of dust and gas between stars started coming out, uh, I'd been studying the gas between stars for, I'm well into my third decade doing this. I got a call from my dad after seeing some of these pictures in the New York Times saying, you know, it, I finally get it, the space between stars, there's stuff in there. Um, and uh, this was both gratifying and, uh, you know, in some ways uh, confusing, but, uh, um, so, but this is a picture of the Carina Nebula in the Milky Way galaxy from NASA's new James Webb Space Telescope. And what you can see here is that 
Uh, this picture reveals these sort of stunning clouds of interstellar dust tracing interstellar gas between the stars. And this represents both the fuel for new stars and the remnants of past generations of stars. And it's not just some random nebula in the Milky Way either. So I think this is my favorite picture of the last year that my teammates and I have taken using the James Webb Space Telescope. So th this is a picture looking at the nearby galaxy Messier 74. And it's, again, a picture where the sort of grayish blue tones show the dust and gas between stars. Uh, and what you can see from this picture is that this interstellar gas and dust just pervades galaxies. And it's not a smooth distribution, but it's this complex, constantly evolving network of clouds. Forming, uh, you see forming stars in red. You see holes and shells that we'll come back to later in the uh, presentation uh, emerging in, uh, among this dust and gas. Uh, and we'll see much more of this in a moment. Um, but this vibrant, dynamic picture is essentially what we see whenever we look at a galaxy like the Milky Way. So here we see another nearby galaxy. Uh, this one's not so poetically named. This is NGC 1672. Um, and what you see on the top is a picture from Hubble uh, where the stars are in blue. Um, and the bright pink nebulae that you see are light, that's been, are light from nebulae that have been heated up by young, massive newborn stars. Uh, and you can see in the bottom the sort of dusty, the glow of dusty interstellar material seen by the James Webb Space Telescope, which shows you a rich network of interstellar material filling this galaxy. The pink in the top shows recently born stars. The brown in the bottom shows the fuel to make new stars. Uh, and the link between the two is what I'm going to try to talk to you about in most of the rest of this talk. So my plan, basically, is to convince you that galaxies are, in many ways, ecosystems. Uh, and then to tell you a little bit about how we're studying these things by lining up all types of telescopes. Uh, and then if we have a few minutes at the end, I'll bring up some interesting details that I think connect to a lot of other things that you may have heard about in uh, Science Sundays or in reading uh, about astronomy. Um, but overall, my high-level goal here is to convince you that galaxies are beautiful and have you walk out of here looking at galaxies in a little bit of a different way than you did when you came in. Um, so let's dive in, though, to this question of galaxies as ecosystems. So I'm going to start by asking, where do stars come from? Um, and the answer is that our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, uh, and others are home to thousands of stellar nurseries, which also sometimes are given the more technical name of molecular clouds. So these are cold, and when I say cold, I mean really cold, like 20 degrees above absolute zero, so like 20 degrees Kelvin. Um, they're dark protected from the starlight that pervades the galaxy by dense concentrations of interstellar dust. Um, and they have dense concentrations of interstellar gas. So in these dense, cold, dark places, uh, the interstellar gas that we've seen pervading galaxies in the last few pictures can give in to the pull of gravity. There's nothing to stop gravity from pulling that gas together. And it'll pull that gas together and collapse that gas until it forms a new generation of stars. And it's only the internal heat from stars that will eventually stop gravity from contracting that gas down. You essentially have to ignite new stars in order to stop the cold, dark, dense gas in these stellar nurseries from forming. So the picture here shows one of the nearest stellar nurseries to the Milky Way. So this is the so-called Taurus molecular cloud complex. It's hanging out in the constellation Taurus. Um, and you'll see in the next slide that I show you that, in fact, these stellar nurseries are scattered around the sky behind constellations that we may know and love and can see only the stars in in the night sky. Um, and what you see is the, the glow of the cloud in radio and infrared light. And in insets, you can see, with pointers to where they're forming, uh, newly born stars scattered around this stellar nursery. So it's not just Taurus that's the only constellation that's hiding a stellar nursery. I would say the most famous constellation seems like it's probably Orion by a large margin. Um, and it turns out that uh, Orion itself actually has a whole hidden life uh, as the nearest giant molecular cloud to us. It's the nearest place that massive stars are forming. Um, and so I really like this picture. There's several versions of this um, that uh, that shows you what Orion would look like if you had radio or infrared eyes and could see the interstellar material behind the famous stars like Betelgeuse and, uh, the, and Orion's belt. And you'd see a constellation pervaded by cold, dark interstellar material that's fuel for future stars. And you can see down in the Orion Nebula, which we'll come back to uh, in the next slide, uh, that there's also a collection of 
big, bright, hot stars that are creating a much hotter nebula. These are stars that have already been born and heated up the gas around them. So just south of Orion's belt, there's one of these uh, bright nebulae heated up by young massive stars. These are sort of the next step in the ecosystem that we would talk about. Once these stellar nurseries form stars, they're gonna stop being cold and dark because stars shine. And it's especially true that whenever you make a star that's much more massive than the sun, uh, the star produces incredible light and pours energy into the surrounding interstellar material. This is especially true for stars that are 10 times or more massive than the sun. These things are incredibly hot, incredibly bright, and we'll see live incredibly short lives. So after nurseries make these massive stars, the stars light up their surroundings. So they create these beautiful nebulae where the gas is no longer 20 Kelvin, but is more like 10,000 degrees Kelvin, which is closer to the surface of the sun than it, is to the surface, than it is to the sort of 20 Kelvin in the stellar nursery that formed it. Um, and these nebulae glow, and they glow in very particular colors that are signatures of the elements uh, that are being lit up by the stars. Um, so these nebulae are often called H2 regions because the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen in them has been ionized. Astronomers famously not that great at naming things, so they just name it hydrogen II for we've pulled the electron off of the hydrogen. Um, but what they lack in imaginative name, they make up for in beauty. And, uh, and in particular, I don't know if uh, we have astro amateur astronomers in the audience, but these H2 regions are classic targets for backyard telescopes. So things like the Rosette Nebula or the Orion Nebula, I don't know if anybody uh, wants to wave a hand if you've looked at these things through an eyepiece at some point. Uh, I see a few tentative hands waving. And you know, I encourage you, there are occasionally public star parties uh, run out of OSU. If you see the opportunity, you should grab a chance and look through the telescope on the roof of Smith. Um, so the Orion Nebulae and the Rosette Nebulae are examples of this hot gas heated up by massive stars, new nebulae around young massive stars. But this sort of change in surroundings wrought by being near, by gas being near a young massive star is only sort of just the beginning. In addition to sort of being blazing hot while they live, uh, massive stars, again, say more than about 10 times the mass of the sun, live relatively short lifetimes. I'm going to say only 10 to 30 million years, and that's an only that only an astronomer could love. Um, but I'll come back to a couple points of comparison in a minute. Remember that the sun is already 5 billion years old, and we are not worrying that the sun is about to turn off, right? So 10 million is much faster. The solar system, we think, hadn't even completely formed by the time that uh, one of these stars would blow up. Um, and when they die, they don't go quietly, so they explode. And if you're a regular at Science Sundays, you've heard about these supernova explosions in other Science Sunday talks. They're a major source of new elements and exotic particles. So if you, for example, came to talks by John Beacom or Todd Thompson, um, you, would have heard that, uh, you would have heard about how these are the sources of the material that make us up uh, or the sources of particles that we hope to be able to detect directly with new types of telescopes. They're also visible across the universe. So briefly, these exploding stars can outshine whole galaxies. And so these supernova have been key to figuring out uh, that the universe, in fact, appears to be accelerating and just mapping out its expansion. But here, what we care about is that the stars born in stellar nurseries and then cocooned in H2 regions are exploding as literal nuclear bombs in the place where they had been born. And so you have a bomb that essentially can outshine a whole galaxy for a limited period of time going off in the interstellar material. Uh, and this is, as you could imagine, a pretty extreme event to subject the material between stars to. So after one of these supernovae go off, they change things very dramatically. So they create new nebulae that are now not full of 10,000 degree gas or 20 Kelvin gas, but million Kelvin gas, so million degree gas. And that gas is so hot that you're no longer using an optical telescope uh, like that you could actually look at with your eye or a radio telescope that can see cold dust and gas. Uh, but now you need to see the x-rays that they emit. They are hot enough that they are just glowing in x-rays. And while they're exploding like this, they're vaporizing the surrounding material. So you can see an example of an x-ray picture of one of these explosions here. So this is the Cassiopeia A explosion. Went off about 300 years ago in our own Milky Way and is still expanding at an amazing rate. So the... You know, these expansions don't just last for a few hundred years. If you light off bombs, in the middle of the interstellar material in a galaxy, uh, it's going to have a dramatic effect over a really wide area, especially if you light off 
you know, stars like to form together. You saw a whole bunch of stars forming a torus together. You could imagine that if a bunch of those exploded together as supernova explosions, they would work in concert. And when they do that, we think that these things can blast holes and shells in the interstellar material that can span for thousands of light years. And so if you look back at this picture that I had shown you before, I hope now look at it with eyes towards where you don't see the dust and you can see all these circular sort of holes and shells. So we think that these are things that may have been blasted by these supernova explosions and, and essentially represent vaporizing the neighborhood where we built a previous generation of stars. So if you step back, you can see that sort of what I'm painting here is a picture uh, that's not just stuff, that it's not just sort of stuff happening in a galaxy, it's a linked picture that's a life cycle of stellar nurseries going from cold, dark stellar nurseries to massive stars surrounded by warm gas to supernova explosions to blast waves that then carve out a big uh, part of the surrounding galaxy. But that's not quite a life cycle. That's like a life arc. Uh, for it to be a cycle, we need to close it. And for that, we need to ask where these stellar nurseries themselves come from. So the quick answer to this is that in addition to the sort of cold, dark stellar nurseries, Galaxies are full of a little bit warmer, lower density interstellar material. This stuff pervades galaxies. It's super low density. So it's one particle per cubic centimeter. Uh, now, that may not mean anything. I mean, it sounds like a small number. It's 10 to the 19 times smaller than the density of air. That also probably doesn't mean anything. That number's too big for my brain to wrap my head around. So I, I tried to write it down as 10 million trillion times less dense than air, but I think you will just, we'll just have to agree that it is much, much, much less dense than air. <laughs> sort of, you know, you can make a cubic centimeter and then imagine one hydrogen uh, particle in that. But the thing is, you know, so you would say, okay, well, maybe that stuff doesn't matter. But the thing is, there's a lot of space in galaxies. So you can balance out one particle per cubic centimeter by having a lot of cubic centimeters. Um, and in a galaxy like the Milky Way, as much as 10 or 20% of the overall matter at any given time uh, may be this low density gas. Um, while for a littler galaxy, and this here is uh, Messier 33, which if you were a fan of the nearest galaxies to us, it's a galaxy like Andromeda, it's the Triangulum Galaxy, it's one of the closest spiral galaxies to us. And a galaxy like this that's a little littler than the Milky Way, this low density gas may have as much mass in it as the stars themselves in total. So a lot of space, low density, and this low density gas has a future as these stellar nurseries. When you pull this low density gas together, thanks to the pull of gravity on the material, or because the material is, say, compressed, because you're lighting off these bombs and compressing material, you'll push the, uh, you'll push the gas into a regime where gravity can take hold, and it starts to collapse down and get denser, and darker, and colder. Um, and this is how you make new stellar nurseries. Spiral arms are great at this, and it'll happen on its own given this low density gas, given time and the right conditions. So at this point, we have a life cycle. So we have a cycle of stellar birth uh, in stellar nurseries. We have the massive stars affecting their surroundings, visible via, via the glow of the warm gas. They blow up, they carve, their, you know, they carve holes and shells in their surroundings, and then a new generation of stellar nurseries will form. Um, and so this cycle is going on constantly in galaxies everywhere you look. And to sort of drive home the sort of this is going on constantly and repeatedly, I want to make the point that this process is fast and local. Uh, and this is, again, this is an astronomer's fast and an astronomer's version of local. So, um, so a galaxy like the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. So we live about 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I've been showing you a bunch of pictures of nearby regions in the Milky Way that exemplify the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant, the Rosette H2 region, the Taurus molecular cloud. These are all tens of light years to 100 light years across. So when you talk about one of these sort of units of this ecosystem, you're talking about something that's a thousand times smaller across than the Milky Way. And because the Milky Way is, you're thinking in area terms, there's area here for a million of these things scattered across the face of the Milky Way galaxy. So there are many little patches doing each of these things at any given time. And when I say fast, I also mean this relative to an astronomer. We mentioned that the sun is five billion years old. The Milky Way itself, a good age to think about for the Milky Way is about 10 billion years. The universe is about 14 billion years old. 
And if you want to imagine a scale on which the Milky Way like, adjusts itself or changes around, it spins around about every 200 million years. And so compared to that, what we've been saying is that a stellar nursery makes its stars in about 20 million years. Those H2 regions around stars last, say, five or 10 million years. And then those massive stars will explode in somewhere between three and 30 million years. So the picture here is that this process is playing out fast. You get a nursery, it does its thing fast compared to the length of time over which the galaxy kind of hangs out and looks the way it does. So when you see a picture like this, like the one that I started out with, I want you to envision sort of popcorn or fireworks constantly going off across the galaxy. This is a picture of the H2 regions. Each of the gold dots on top of the stars here is a picture of where there's hot gas around a set of young massive stars. Each of them were a stellar nursery before this. Each of those locations will have supernova explosions if we wait around 10, you know, a short 10 or 20 million years. Um, and so you can imagine that you, know, you come back in 5 million years, and this distribution looks kind of the same, but kind of different. It's constantly going pop, 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 pop. Stellar nursery, supernova explosion, H2 region supernova explosion makes some new stellar nurseries. So you can see here, this is the idea that I want you to sort of walk away with in terms of saying that galaxies host ecosystems or galaxies are ecosystems. To me, at least, there's a good similarity here to the life cycle that you would imagine playing out constantly in a forest. So saplings form, they grow into trees, the trees die, fall over, and then the material from the decomposing trees forms the fuel for new generations of saplings. The forest is looking the same if you come back every, you know, looks kind of the same if you come back every few decades, but it's not exactly the same. There's constantly this cycle playing out uh, and building up the forest over time. Uh, and so I'm gonna flash a couple of pictures that you saw already and ask you to just take a minute here and see if you can see you know, the H2 regions and the massive stars on the top and the sort of clouds of concentrated uh, interstellar dust and gas in the bottom showing you stellar nurseries and then the interstellar material. Here you can see some of the sort of streamlines of interstellar material that'll collide and give you stellar nurseries. You can see that we saw the effect of the overall blast waves. Um, so hopefully you have eyes at this point that can sort of see ecosystems playing out constantly in parts of galaxies, not just collections of stars. Um, but we live on the sun, a five billion year old star. Where do we fit into this? So this highlights another important part of this overall ecosystem. So the sun's about five billion years old. The sun absolutely formed as part of this overall cycle, um, but it survived the overall cycle. It didn't blow up. The sun is not going to go supernova. That's not what it has in store for us. Um, we've got, you know, a, you don't have to worry about the fate of the sun for at least a billion years and, you know, mostly for something like five billion years. So this is, we have good real estate here. Um, so the idea is that the sun formed as part of this overall process along with a whole bunch of siblings uh, that are also lower mass, longer lived stars, many of which we think host planets. Um, but the, the trick here is that this whole ecosystem is playing out in a way that's uh, very much oriented towards low efficiency and uh, is driven by the sort of 1% of most massive stars. So a key thing about this ecosystem is that it works essentially because the top 1% of stars in mass uh, exert a really outsized impact on their surrounding environments. They also give us most of the sort of beautiful light that we can see in the blue and ultraviolet and those H2 regions from galaxies. So a hallmark of this cycle is that it's driven by massive stars. These are the ones that are going to make these H2 regions. These are going to blow up as supernovae. But if you look here at this illustration of the distribution of star masses when you make a bunch of stars, overwhelmingly you're making things that are more like the sun. And so as you run this cycle, you make a bunch of suns, and then you make a few high mass stars. They're gonna blow up and outshine the Milky Way, so they get a lot of attention. Uh, you know, if we were doing this in class, I would draw a really forced analogy to celebrities or something like that, but I'll leave that for you in the, uh, um, so you can imagine, you know, they generate all the light, they, you know, have sort of explosive implosions. Um, but so the idea then, where the sun fits in here, is that the sun 
is born along with a bunch of other stars, initially sometimes in a cluster that's bound together by gravity, sometimes in a cluster that just happens to be close to each other. These clusters of recently born stars are also great targets for backyard telescopes. Uh, you can also see things like the Pleiades. You know, I could also ask, does anybody drive a Subaru? Because that's, that's on the back of your car then. There you go, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, so you can see some of these by eye. These are great backyard telescope targets. But over time, they're going to drift apart. The sun started presumably in something like this, or maybe in a cluster that lasted a little bit longer than that. But over time, just being in the Milky Way, you get tugged on by a lot of things, and stars drift apart. I'm not going to make a forced analogy for this either, but you can come up with it. You can also come up with this. So the idea is that uh, the stellar nurseries only form about one percent of their material into stars. That's set by how quickly those massive stars turn on and just blast all the material away. The first few massive stars you get have a very big impact on your environment. And then only about 1% of those stars that are formed are actually going to blow up and go away and drive this ecosystem. The rest gets left over and contributed to the galaxy. So you can see this ecosystem is really a driver for building up galaxies like the Milky Way or Andromeda over time. The sun is an output of this cycle. So. I've given you a sketch of what this sort of ecosystem looks like. Um, how do we actually build this picture? So this is what I spend most of my time on, and it's where there's been an enormous observational advance in observational capabilities over the last five, 10 years. So I've shown you a lot of pictures of nearby things in the Milky Way. But what I'm going to show you in the second half of the talk is that we now have the ability to take pictures of nearby galaxies, and again, this is a nearby that only an astronomer can love. We, do, we can do this out to distances of 50 million light years, um, thanks to a new generation of telescopes that get this ecosystem across all the key parts of the ecosystem. So we can actually take pictures of this ecosystem in action. And the idea here is a little similar to what I mentioned with the forest. So what we want to do, we don't want to wait around for 10 million years. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not a futurologist. I don't know what things are going to look like in 10 million years. But mostly, I'm just curious, and I want to know how this all works now. Um, so we want to take pictures of the saplings and the decomposing trees and the adult trees and the medium-sized trees and use that to build a picture of this ecosystem. And that's a lot of what fed into the picture that I just gave you in the first part of the talk. And to do that, what we need to do is we need to look at all of the parts of this ecosystem, and that requires going across the electromagnetic spectrum because the different parts of this ecosystem emit differently. They, so we're studying them with light, uh, but it's different types of light that you would get from a 20 Kelvin cloud of gas and dust or the X-ray glow of a recently exploded supernova. And so I'm going to highlight here advances that have been made looking at these different types of regions in galaxies. Uh, and what I you know, immediately want you to see here is that you're using radio light, and you're using infrared light, and optical light, and you're looking for ultraviolet light to tell you where the young stars are, and even x-rays have an important role to play. So this involves spanning the electromagnetic spectrum. And to do that, but also because recently born clusters of stars and H2 regions and clouds, they're all tiny at the distances to other galaxies. You also need fantastically sharp images. So to both catch these different types of light and to make images that are sharp enough to see individual parts of the ecosystem, you need to get to either the tops of the highest, driest mountains on Earth, so illustrated here, with large optical and radio telescopes, or if you want to uh, study pictures like the glowing dust that I've been showing you from the James Webb Telescope, you can't do that from under the atmosphere at all, so you need to get up into space. If you want to take pictures of clusters of recently formed stars in other galaxies, you need the Hubble Space Telescope because it makes such sharp images and it can get to ultraviolet wavelengths. We're happy that our atmosphere works the way it does. I think there's no astronomer who would actually make this trade. Um, but it does block many types of light, and it blurs out the images that we can get. So I'm going to kind of step through here some of the telescopes that have changed how we look at other galaxies by resolving them into the fundamental units of this ecosystem that I told you about. Uh, and the first of these, uh, partially because I worked there for several years, uh, nearest and dearest to my heart, is uh, ALMA which is the most powerful radio telescope in the world. This is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, which is 
an array of radio dishes constructed heavily with investment by the National Science Foundation. So this is a multi-billion dollar facility that's up in the, Chile the Atacama Desert, high in the Chilean Andes. This is the highest, driest place that you could get to that has a nice, a like nice plateau that you could build an array of antennas on, uh, on Earth. It's actually a, uh, some really great documentaries about this on streaming services. I encourage you to watch. Um, but what Alma does is it changes a view of a stellar nursery from the thing on the left, which is what it looks like if you use optical light, and you're like, oh, the dust is just blocking everything. You can't see anything. It's just cold and dark, to something like what you see on the right. So that shows you the glow, because radio telescopes catch low energy photons that can be emitted by very cold gas. You are able to immediately light up stellar nurseries and directly take a picture of where these th things are. And it turns out you get a very good idea of how they're moving. So Alma's an amazing machine and has really revolutionized our view of stellar nurseries and galaxies. And I'll show you a couple of pictures. So we've used Alma to take pictures of the stellar nurseries in 100 galaxies at this point. And this has brought our complete pictures of stellar nurseries and galaxies up from one to 100, which has been awesome. Um, but so you can see a picture here in red of the glow of cold, uh, dense gas that's going to form stars in the future, here from Messier 99, here from Messier 100. Uh, and so uh, you see that galaxies are full of these stellar nurseries. The fuel for the next generation of stars is just hanging out there ready to explode. What about seeing the next gen the generation of stars that just formed? So for that, if you wanted to go capture the H2 regions and the glow of warm gas around recently formed massive stars, optical telescopes are what you want. And uh, a huge advance here, something that OSU is heavily involved in deploying sort of next generation technology on, but a huge advance here over the last uh, 10 years is that we've shifted from just taking pictures of the sky using optical telescopes or taking, dispersing the light and taking one spectrum of the sky to going and measuring the light at all frequencies across the optical domain at every location. So that's a little bit technical. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to dive super far into that, but just to say that essentially you've added an entire extra dimension to the optical, uh, to the optical light that we get from galaxies over the last 10 years. Um, so the very large telescopes uh, in, um, run by uh, the European Southern Observatory in Chile are leaders in this. The large binocular telescope that OSU runs has some very good capabilities in this direction, and OSU has been a leader in deploying new robotic fiber technology to do this for the next generation of the Sloan Digitized Sky Survey uh, in a project called the Local Volume Mapper, which is going to deploy this technology to map huge swaths of the Milky Way and the nearby Magellanic Clouds. Um, so these, we, uh, my colleagues and I have done a lot with the very large telescopes, so with the, the ESO, um, uh, the ESO instruments. And so these are images in, uh, this one is again Messier 99. These are images where in gold you see the glow of H2 regions. Uh, so these are the recently formed stars. And if this looks sort of similar to what you saw with the stellar nurseries, that's right. You're watching different phases of the thing, of the ecosystem sort of pop off. They're closely linked to each other. If you put them on top of each other, they're not in exactly the same place because you're looking at a before and after. Um, and from that comparison, you can learn a lot, and that fuels a lot of the things I mentioned in the first part of the talk. This is more of these H2 regions seen in galaxies. And because we have this three-dimensional view, we actually know about the heavy elements and temperature and all sorts of details about each of these, uh, each of these ionized gas regions. Uh, we're moving out of Messier galaxies here from Messier 66 into NGC 1087. But even though it's an NGC galaxy, uh, it's still it's still very good. The background here, if you want the amateur astronomy, it's Messier made a catalog of fuzzy objects in the sky before the new general catalog was made. So a Messier object tends to be one of the most beautiful things you can point a telescope at. Uh, and an NGC galaxy tends to be very beautiful, but tends to require a bigger telescope to get a beautiful picture. Um, but this is more for the amateur astronomer. Uh, um, so. 
We can also take pictures, and Hubble has changed the game on this, especially since if people tracked the upgrade to the Hubble telescope in the early 2010s, uh, I don't know if they still show the IMAX movie for this, but it is the coolest thing you've ever seen. Uh, if, if you get a chance to see that at any point, you should totally see it. The upgrade to the Hubble uh, capabilities allowed it to take fantastic pictures across the spectrum of massive stars and young forming clusters in nearby galaxies so that we could see something like this which is the R136 cluster powering the sort of strong, strongest star forming region in the Milky Way's neighbor, the Large Magellanic Cloud. But we now see these across whole sets of nearby galaxies. So uh, this is again showing you NGC 1087, in, uh, but now looking at the blue light that comes directly from the surfaces of the young massive stars. Um, here's NGC 4535, the one that I've been showing you pictures of the H2 regions in from the opening slide onwards. Uh, Hubble also has the ability to chase after H2 regions, um, and you can see those showing up in this pinkish glow. Uh, and this is essentially, over the last 15 years, Hubble has built a statistical picture of the clusters and stars that form uh, from this process. It's been an absolute, uh, absolute game changer in understanding star clusters. So in terms of chasing the explosions themselves, I would be derelict if I didn't point out that OSU has been, you know, was the absolute world leader for the 2010s with the absolutely fantastic Assassin project, uh, which I think you've heard about in a couple of these Science Sundays. Um, Assassin, you know, supernovae are rare. One goes off in a galaxy like the Milky Way about every 100 years. So the way you find them is by looking at a lot of galaxies uh, for several years, because uh, again, we're not patient. Um, and so Assassin has been taking pictures of the sky uh, every few days for more than a decade now, and uh, for a long period of time was finding most of the bright supernovae in the sky. Um, and so a lot of what we know about the actual direct explosions of stars in the neighborhood come from supernovae that were found by Assassin. Um, moving into the sort of next decade, the thing that people are very excited about is that the National Science Foundation uh, has been investing in something called the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is a project, again, in Chile, you're detecting a theme here, um, uh, but is, is constructed and heading towards giving us our first data over the next year. So the idea here is to take something that's the size of the current biggest telescopes in the world. I think it's about eight meters across. and It's got a weird hole in the center, but this is essentially taking a giant telescope and taking pictures of the sky every few nights because it has this incredible field of view. These data are going to be open to everyone, and this should revolutionize our view of where supernovae are going off across the universe. For a lot of the local galaxies, like I showed you, Assassin's still going to lead, but, uh, um, but it's the exciting thing coming up in terms of finding the explosions of stars that sort of terminate uh, the last bits of stellar nurseries or blow these holes in the interstellar material. Um, but far and away, I have absolutely saved the best for last, because uh, far and away, the thing that has been most a revelation on this over the last couple of years is the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is, for decades, this has been promised to astronomers as NASA's successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and it's hard to describe how much people just did not believe that this was actually going to happen before it actually went up uh, successfully in Christmas a couple of years ago. And it's also... There, it's, it's actually, I will say, easy to explain how much of a success against all of those expectations it's been. Because the way you explain that is you just show these pictures. Like the proof is absolutely in both the images and the science. It has been incredibly productive at revolutionizing our view. I'm showing you here how ecosystems work in nearby galaxies. And to me, these, you know, the pictures I'll show you are some of those beautiful that it's produced. Um, but it's also seen the dawn of the formation of the first galaxies and had a big impact already on understanding how planets form. Um, and so the James Webb sees very effectively the dust grains that are mixed in with the gas between stars, and it sees it with a sensitivity and a sharpness of view that is something we've never had at the infrared part of the spectrum before. This is a part of the spectrum you can't get to because the atmosphere blocks it from the ground. And previously, we've been talking about, uh, you know, previously we've been talking about facilities that were, you know, tiny things uh, compared to the, you know, compared to the six meter extent here. So James Webb's out there orbiting L2 and just doing absolutely amazing science. And, you know, we're lucky to have it for potentially the next decade or even two. 
So these are pictures of, these are some of the pictures that James, that the JWST has taken of uh, nearby galaxies showing you the interstellar material. And uh, it also is very good at catching, out, catching stars that have just formed because they're still hiding behind a whole bunch of dust and need infrared eyes to see through that dust and see the glow of the young stars, the youngest stars and clusters before they show up as H2 regions. So this is again Messier 100. You can see detailed intricate networks. This is Messier 95. Um, so you know, again, absolutely stunning detail in seeing the material between the stars. And I'll be honest, when we uh, put together the programs to observe nearby galaxies, what we thought we were really gonna get was a hidden generation of stars hiding behind the dust. Um, but very much actually seeing the stellar nurseries themselves has been the most exciting thing to come out of this. This sort of intricate, sensitive, sharp detail that you get on the interstellar material is a view that we have only barely had before from ALMA. It's something, it's something really new. Um, and I'm gonna show you, so this one is not as beautifully composed because I'm gonna show you something that is literally hot off the presses, something we observed only two weeks ago and has rapidly become my favorite picture. Um, so this is the Sculptor Galaxy, NGC 253. It's one of the closest galaxies beyond Andromeda that resembles the Milky Way galaxy. And this is a picture of the glowing dust in the Sculptor Galaxy. Um, I need to learn how to do the like Ken Burns scroll across the image because this is a 30 megabyte PNG and the projector is not doing it justice. So I thought what I would do is say, you're looking at the interstellar material here and I want your eye to sort of pick out both sort of networks. So this is zooming in on the left and you can sort of pick out, I really want to go over there and point at things, but uh, I want you to pick out, um, uh, pick out little knots of material that you think will be generations of the sort of next stars. Look for bubbles that you think might be shells blown by interstellar material. Uh, here's the center of the overall galaxy. We'll talk a little bit about what these lines and that X are in just a moment to wrap us up. And then here's the right-hand side. So uh, somebody had asked beforehand about uh, having access to these things. I think this is actually an interesting point for the general public is to talk about sort of how this actually happens. So all of the facilities that I've just talked about, um, or almost all of the facilities that I've just talked about, are products of huge investment by NASA and the National Science Foundation, almost run by the National Radio Observatory on behalf of the National Science Foundation. These are all open facilities that anyone in the world, if they have an idea about how to use these facilities, can write a proposal for. And so the idea is that they take the best ideas they evaluate them via peer review and select what these telescopes, which are you know, billion dollar facilities are going to do. I think this is, you know, to me this is great, right? Like it's really respecting the idea of major investment, just get the best ideas and do the best thing. Um, but it also very much means that if you're wondering about the things that keep an astronomer up at night, one of them is observing, and then the other thing is actually putting proposals into these things. So uh, just to show you how exciting things have been, this is a plot of how many proposals were submitted to the JWST is the red curve at the top as a function of time until you have to turn them in. Uh, uh, so that's counting down to zero and you watch this exponential curve grow. And you can see the other things are other times that people have done this. So it's always, everybody puts it off to the last minute and then the last day you just watch this thing spike. Um, but the takeaway here too is that there are almost 2000 proposals going into JWST, so they're really, everyone is just bringing their best ideas and they pick a couple hundred of these, uh, which means you have to have a really thick skin to play this game, but it also means that, you know, everybody is just throwing their absolute best ideas out there um, and is very excited about this thing. Um, so I have a, a, I wanted to close by just giving you a couple of sort of more detailed points to come out of this and hooks to other things you might think about. It's sort of three or four slides left. Does that make sense to, awesome. Um, so the first of these is that I've talked to you about a life cycle that plays out within galaxies, but there's actually a really neat connection here that this, this is actually partially how galaxies stay the way they are. So I want to sort of say, you know, if we go back to this idea of a bunch of interstellar material between stars, uh, if you leave it alone, gravity's gonna win. It's gonna pull it together. And if you leave it alone enough, gravity's just gonna pull all that material into stars. And on a pretty short time scale, it's only a few tens of millions of years, you would take all of the material in a galaxy like this, like the, the Messier 33, the Triangulum Galaxy, or the Milky Way, and you'd turn it into stars. 
That doesn't happen. We look out and we see a bunch of normal looking galaxies uh, that have been doing the same thing for billions of years. We know that because we can use our telescopes as time machines and just look across the universe, take pictures like the Hubble picture that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, it does occasionally happen, but that's more of a like cookies and coffee question. Um, so this ecosystem is a lot of the reason why this doesn't happen. So the explosions from supernovae and the push back from the massive stars at the cores of H2 regions counteract gravity. They mean that when you form stars, you do so only with a very low efficiency, and then it pushes everything back apart and says, no, no, form another generation of stars. So those one percents that I was talking about, the low efficiency, the push back from supernova explosions and from forming massive stars, counteract the pull of gravity that wants a galaxy to turn its interstellar gas into stars. And this holds galaxies in a sort of balance. And so the term we use for this is feedback. Uh, so it's a push back after you form stars because star formation pushes back on the surrounding medium. And it turns out that this is actually a stable system. So it's, a, it's negative feedback. If you perturb the galaxy and you made too many stars, the pushback would get stronger. Uh, and if you made too few stars, gravity would win, and then you would make more stars to balance it out. So galaxies have a built-in thermostat similar to how stars work, and it's this ecosystem doing the balancing out. Um, so galaxies self-regulate in important ways. The sort of last point that I would want to make is just that if you've been watching all of these pictures fly by, you may have said to yourself at some point, what's going on at the center of that galaxy? Um, because they all look, you know, not all of them, many of them look very striking. And the Milky Way does the same thing if we could get outside and take a look at it. Um, and the answer is that I have described this sort of as like popcorn or cycling going on separately in different parts of the galaxy. But the truth is that the overall galaxies themselves also see rivers or flows of gas running through. When you collide material together, the gravity of the galaxy wants to pull it in towards the center. You lose the spin that would support it against, uh, against the pull of the overall galaxy. Just like if you slammed the Earth into another planet and ground it to a halt, you might imagine that some of that material would fall in down towards the sun. So this is going on all the time because it turns out that this interstellar material is really good at getting slammed into other interstellar material. And in particular, things like the prominent spiral arms or bars that tend to be excited as a natural uh, feature in the stellar disks of galaxies tend to induce collisions in the gas and set up rivers of material. So whenever you've seen these sort of linear features running in towards the middle of these galaxies, and this is, I'm gonna just try to illustrate them here, but you can see sort of here, here, here. You'll see that these have been showing up in all the different pictures uh, with bright centers that I've been showing you. This, these are rivers of gas knocked towards the center of the galaxy by the action of stellar bars and spiral arms. So that feeds material towards the center of a galaxy where it feeds supermassive black holes, which is a you know, topic for a whole other science Sunday. But this is how you get material down into the inner parts of the galaxy. It doesn't get you to all the way to the supermassive black hole, but it gets you close. It also forms giant regions where there's tons and tons of star formation going on. So in the Milky Way, 10% of the stars form in the inner sort of 0.1% of the area. And that's a very common thing here. And the last sort of point that I'll make is that this can at times get so extreme, and this is actually quite common, and again, it's a, it's a topic that a number of people in our department study. Um, this can at times get so extreme that especially in the centers of these galaxies, the action of supernovae and the, the push of the massive stars can blow material. The thing on the left is not an artist's conception. It is actual uh, showing an explosion at the center of a nearby galaxy, the Messier 82 where material has just been blasted out from the center of the galaxy into the space around galaxies. And the last point that I'll sort of leave you with is that you know, there's an entirely different talk which says that if you, as you throw material out of galaxies, you have a similar dance of stars pushing things out, gravity trying to pull it back, and then pulling material back into the galaxy so that it can rerun these ecosystems that I'm talking about. So there's a whole other layer of ecosystems on top of this. 
Uh, and I'm not totally leaving you with turtles all the way down, but I am pretty much leaving you with turtles all the way down. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Uh, and mostly, I hope that you will agree with me on zero, but I hope you do leave with uh, new eyes for how galaxies look. <laughs>
the, it's self-gravity that's the dominant thing for causing things to collapse, which is like you get a sphere of gas. So imagine you have a sphere of gas that has no means to support it. It'll just fall in on itself. So what you need to do is you need to somehow create an over-dense pocket of gas where the pull of the gas on the, uh, all the parts of the gas and the other parts of the gas will cause things to collapse in. Um, so I'm gonna give a bit of a technical answer. So the, the question here was, you know, what actually triggers the immediate collapse? I'm gonna give you a too technical answer and then happy to talk more over coffee. But one of the big things that people are very interested in is that these stellar nurseries are highly turbulent. They move around and you have density fluctuations up and down. And so what you imagine is that turbulence will naturally produce over densities. It'll produce fluctuations up in the overall density. And when those things push up, to the density where self-gravity can now kick in and all the stuff is like, oh, now I'm stuck to my neighbor by gravity, then that ball of material will collapse out and start collapsing down towards forming a new cluster of stars or a new star. Um, so it's the gravity of the gas on itself, but you have to do some things to pack it together into a small enough region. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's really great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, um, one of the points about the solar system that uh, in popular culture is, is, is always being pointed out is the concept of the black hole. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, because the way you're describing the stellar uh, nurseries, it sounded something like a black hole. Are they comparable and in what way so? So they are factories for produce. So the question is, what's the relationship to black holes here? So I would say there's two places that this hooks. So the, the sources, I mean, so, there's a similarity to black holes in the sense that gravity is driving the whole game, right? Like, so it's about gravity pulling things together. Um, the stars are in some sense a stopover on the way to producing black holes in some cases. So mostly what'll happen is that you make stars and fusion stops you. And the sun is an example of fusion stopping gravity for 10 billion years. For the massive stars, gravity stops you but only for 10 or 20 million years. And so the, the link to black holes here is that those massive stars that I'm talking about, the biggest of them will explode or just collapse and turn into black holes. So it's very much the endpoint of a fork of this process. But it's, you could imagine there's sort of a chain of outcomes. If you started with these gas over densities, there's a chain of outcomes, some of which end with a sun and a solar system hanging out for 10 billion years before something happens, and others end with a black hole forming by direct collapse in another 10 or 20 million years. I'll just say the other link to the black holes and what I talked about is that they hang out at the center when I showed you these things. They're the things hanging out at the very center of these. Inner, those are the supermassive black holes at the very, very center of these things. And so getting the material all the way in in the galaxy is the other part of, of fueling the million mass black holes. I'd like to offer the last question to any brave pre-college students. I see a few. <laughs> Thinking about it? Thinking about it? Okay, here we go. I picked this guy early. Go ahead, bud. So, if this is all, so what happens, how are galaxies that don't have the black holes in the center still staying stable? Is there some, is there another driving force, like other, other sorts of objects, mm -hmm. like clusters of stars that galaxies yep. might be centered around? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the question would be like, if you're looking at something like this and you get gas all the way to the middle, what happens? Um, and you, you said the answer exactly. I mean, so part of the answer is that there is a thing called a nuclear star cluster, which is different than a normal star cluster in the sense that you get multiple generations of material building up at the centers of galaxies. Uh, and sometimes these can coexist with black holes, but it looks like there are some galaxies that just have a nuclear star cluster. I showed you this, uh, it's actually only two slides back. This is one of the most, the thing on the left is one of the most famous ones. Uh, so Messier 33 people have looked for a black hole at the middle of it for literal decades. And they know there's a nuclear star cluster. Uh, well, we've not found a black hole at the middle of the thing. And so you can turn, you can turn that material into stars. Um, but the other thing you can do is the star formation can blast it out. And you can get a cycle by go all the way to the middle, boom, blast things out. And then it can come back further out in a process that's called a fountain or it may make it all the way out to circumgalactic or intergalactic space. Um, but that's why, you know, in some sense, that buildup of material at the center is why you launch these powerful winds from the middle. Okay. One, one last, last. So as, uh, 
So as atoms fuse and get denser and denser, how will that affect the formation of new star clusters? Yeah, so the, uh, so the question is, as you sort of run many generations of this, you build up more and more uh, heavy material over time. Um, so this is a thing that happens over the age of the universe. I will say, mostly what I'm going to say is that you've highlighted one of the most interesting questions that we're trying to tackle, and one of the reasons we try to look at this in a whole bunch of galaxies, the question of how does the, abundant, the pre-existing abundance of heavy elements affect this process? This is one of the things that we try to study by not just looking at our neighborhood in the Milky Way. We try to look at galaxies where heavy elements are not abundant and where heavy elements are abundant. It must matter, because when I throw around dust and making things cold, the things doing the work on that, dust is made of these heavier elements. The way you cool things down is to cool off using heavy elements. And so it does appear to affect the overall process of forming stars. For example, it makes stellar nurseries less common when you have less heavy elements. Um, but I think you know, in detail, there is still some aspect of this, which is good question, TBD. It's one of the reasons we want to observe a whole bunch of these. So it's a good question. Before we wrap up, I just want to say I hope you found the Science Sundays webpage where you can sign up for the email list. You get an email about once a month, and you can see the videos from all the previous talks. Second point I want to make is we can go upstairs now to the traditions room and have a coffee and a cookie and kibitz a bit with Professor Leroy, but let's thank him first. Thank you.